Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the last lecture in our winter 2017 geriatric health care lecture series. My name is Barbara Cochran, and I'm the director of the Deterney Center for Healthy Aging. I'm hoping you can hear me, but I don't know that you can see me. Uh, but things should be working fine as far as being able to see the slides. Um, I am uh, from the School of Nursing, but I also represent the Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center, which is sponsoring this lecture series. And just a reminder that we will be starting up another lecture series in spring term, the end of March. I can't remember the exact date, sorry. But um, that will focus on Alzheimer's disease and related dementia lectures. And uh, I know many of you are looking forward to that sort of general topic area. Uh, just a reminder also to get your evaluations into your site coordinators as well as if you haven't filled out a personal profile form in the past, please do so. We need um, a new one for each lecture series, not for each lecture, uh, but those personal profile forms are the ways that we're able to report off to our funding agency and ensure that this lecture series continues um, in the future. I would also say that you should contact your site coordinators if you're interested in getting continuing education contact hours for this lecture series. Uh, your site coordinator will have information for how you can log into the continuing education website um, and pay, I think it's 45 bucks, and, um, and then register and download the certificate for the lecture series or at least the lectures that you have attended. Today, I'm very uh, happy to introduce you to Bob Roshan Robin. He is um, an acting instructor with medicine at the Division of Nephrology, assistant professor now. Assistant sorry. Professor, sorry. Um, his research focus is to understand the metabolic mechanism linking reduced kidney function with impaired muscle function or sarcopenia, an area well known to us in gerontology, contributing to mobility impairment and mobility disability. In particular, muscle mitochondrial me metabolism links the metabolic derangements of chronic kidney disease with functional decline. So they're currently investigating the role of kidney function decline on muscle mitochondrial metabolism and muscle fatigue. Very interesting and hot topic of research. And furthermore, they're conducting randomized clinical trials testing the efficacy of exercise therapy and pharmacologic therapy on improvement of exercise tolerance and fatigue among patients with moderate to severe kidney disease. Today, um, Dr. Roshan Ravan is going to speak with us about kidney disease and functional decline in older adults, and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so uh, as Dr. Cochran had mentioned, uh, I'll be talking about kidney disease and functional decline in older adults. The uh, outline in my talk today is to uh, basically give you an introduction of how we measure kidney function and uh, what are the what is the definition of a chronic kidney disease, as well as talk about some of the management issues uh, in uh, older adults with chronic kidney disease and how they differ from our approach in uh, younger adults, as well as uh, then proceed to talk about functional decline in kidney disease, the uh, pathophysiology of uh, functional decline, and the epidemiology of functional decline in kidney disease. And if there's time, um, get into uh, a recent area of uh, a hot topic, which is uh, dialysis versus conservative management in CKD in older adults. So in measurement of kidney function is currently estimated using what is commonly called um, estimated glomerular filtration rate. And the marker that we use to uh, estimate glomerular filtration rate is a muscle-based compound, which is creatinine. And although we are looking at estimated gl glomerular filtration rate, the kidney does much more than just filter. It does much more than filter out. It also does things actively, such as secrete and reabsorb. So to uh, uh, simplify it to glomerular filtration actually um, overly simplifies the role of kidney, kidney in actually uh, its metabolic regulation. And here you can see that um, phase one in this diagram is essentially just the basic 
uh, filtration across the glomerulus, which is uh, a uh, bundle of epithelial cells and endothelial cells that filter the uh, toxins. And then in the proximal tubule, there's a process of reabsorption and secretion. So uh, to simplify to glomerular filtration is, is one of the downfalls of current estimation equations of kidney function. As I mentioned, the main marker that's used to assess glomerular filtration and kidney function is serum creatinine. And it's important to understand that the association of serum creatinine with uh, glomerular filtration, uh, a estimate of kidney function, is, is not linear in and of itself. There is quite a bit of imprecision at, uh, at higher ranges of estimated glomerular filtration. There's inherent problems also with measurement using a muscle-based marker such as creatinine. It can be obviously confounded by a muscle mass and issues that may uh, affect nutrition, such as just malnutrition, amputation, and also cirrhosis. Liver disease patients often uh, have low muscle mass, so creatinine can actually uh, um, be uh, less specific in those uh, patients. Furthermore, because uh, creatinine is also secreted, uh, there can be confounding effects by medications, such as tri trimethoprim, which is in Bactrim, uh, uh, cimetidine, uh, and some antiretroviral medications, such as cobecystat and uh, pyrimethamine. Uh, across multiple epidemiologic cohort studies, there is a been demonstrated to be a strong association of reduction in kidney function, uh, both with uh, estimated GFR and albuminuria, another indicator of the uh, diminished integrity of the uh, glomerulus in filtering um, proteins. So in patients across cohort studies, you can see that in the top left, where the y-axis is the hazard ratio or the risk of cardiovascular mortality and the x-axis is glomerular filtration rate, there is a nearly continuous decline in the risk of cardiovascular mortality with increases in glomerular filtration rate. On the bottom left figure, you can see that this, it, when you stratify it by albuminuria, you also get a uh, a consistent association within the strata of albuminuria, so, such that the lower levels of albuminuria have a um, essentially a lower risk at each GFR. So there seems to be a effect modification of the association, whereby uh, there is a, a synergy between uh, lower estimated uh, glomerular filtration or kidney function and um, worsening albuminuria on the increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. Notice on the, uh, on the bottom left corner that as you get into higher uh, GFRs, there seems to be a, um, an increased risk. So it almost has a U-shaped association. That U-shaped association has a lot to do with the imprecision of the estimation of kidney function at higher GFR or glomerular filtration rates. So what is the uh, definition of chronic kidney disease? Well, chronic kidney disease is having either markers of kidney damage or decreased function of the kidney, and that's been persistent for at least three months. And markers of kidney damage, which I mentioned earlier, is a diminished integrity of the filtration barrier, which can manifest as uh, increased albuminuria and albuminuria is defined as an albumin to creatinine ratio of 30 milligrams or more. Uh, 30 to 300 is microalbuminuria, and greater than 300 is macroalbuminuria. You can also see urine sediment abnormalities, such as uh, abnormally shaped red blood cells. That can uh, signify some uh, compromise to the filtration barrier of the glomerulus. Then you can also see um, uh, Structural abnormalities. Sometimes uh, having a unilateral kidney is an early stage uh, chronic kidney disease, just having a solitary kidney. Then there's also functional uh, uh, aspects of 
chronic kidney disease, which is a decrease in the actual function, whether it be by glomerular filtration rate or creatinine clearance. There are multiple possible causes of chronic kidney disease. You can have direct kidney damage, exposures to toxins. You can also have, uh, often, oftentimes, a kidney damage from treatments. And among them, that's most important, and what we see in practice is often uh, NSAID overuse which can result um, in acute kidney injury. You can also have genitourinary anomalies, such as recurrent uh, kidney stones or obstruction or vesicle ure ureteral reflux. Those people who are at particular risk, it's important to consider the demographics that are at, at risk and of acute uh, kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. And these individuals are generally older, they're uh, larger body size, obese, and recently, there's been a uh, identification of some uh, genetic abnormalities among the African American population that increase risk of chronic kidney disease, such as the APOL1 gene or sickle cell trait. It's also important to recognize that there is a additive effect of multiple acute kidney injury episodes on the progression of kidney disease. So in kidney disease is associated with the retention of uremic solutes. These uremic solutes are toxins that are normally uh, excreted by the kidney. However, when you have a retention of uremic solutes, they can cause membrane damage in cells and lead to both oxidative stress and inflammation. And there is a, a additive effect of adiposity on these processes. Oxidative stress can lead to the consumption of nitric oxide, which is really important in endothelial function and uh, uh, dilation of the endothelial, endothelial layer of the blood vessels. Le consumption of nitric oxide and oxidative stress can lead to uh, blood vessel injury, which can also lead to macrophage infiltration and incorporation of cholesterol to form foam cells that are inflammatory within the artery. Uh, this is further augmenting the inflam inflammation that can accelerate atherosclerosis and augment uh, oxidative stress. Ultimately, as kidney disease progresses and become uh, more uh, severe, you can get metabolic acidosis, uh, muscle atrophy, reductions in physical activity, uh, uremic toxins can also affect uh, drug metabolism, particularly uh, liver drug metabolism. You can also get cognitive dysfunction in these individuals. So uh, it's ki chronic kidney disease as it advances can result in a malnutrition inflammation complex. The age itself has been associated with uh, oxidative stress and inflammation. And uh, as as uh, the kidney ages, there is an increase in glomerular sclerosis. Uh, and you can see here in this uh, review by Rule et al., they took kidneys uh, that were biopsied uh, among uh, living kidney donors and looked at the degree of sclerosis of the functional, uh, one of the functional units of the kidney, which is the glomerulus the bundle of uh, epithelial cells and endothelial cells through which uh, fluid is filtered. Um, and you can see here that as you, pro as you get progressively older, there is an increase in the sclerosis score of the glomerulus, such that uh, each increasing darker shade is, associated, is indicating increasing sclerosis, increasing proportion of sclerosis. Furthermore, as uh, the kidney undergoes senescent changes, there is a uh, decline in estimated glomerular filtration rate, such that by the time you get to the average patient uh, it, at the age of around 65, the mean glomerular filtration rate is around 78 to 80. So, um, and you can see here that um, it's uh, a little bit higher in men, which is in the figure on the left, where you have the y-axis, the estimated glomerular filtration rate, and the x-axis is the age group. Uh, left side being males, right side uh, is females, 
and you can see that um, by the time you reach uh, 65 years of age, your mean GFR is somewhere uh, around 80 for men and uh, 78 or 75 to 80 for women. The uh, kidney disease um, uh, guidelines uh, have recently, uh, as of 2012, created a classification system whereby they take into account uh, kidney function and albuminuria to risk stratify uh, individuals and recommend uh, evaluation and planning for uh, further therapies. So as you can see on the, uh, on the rows, the rows are essentially estimates of glomerular filtration um, with number one being greater than 90 and number five being uh, less than 15. Uh, and the columns represent the levels of uh, albuminuria. With increasing albuminuria and increasing GFR, you can see that the red areas indicate uh, increasing risk of adverse outcome, whether it is cardiovascular disease or progression to uh, need for kidney replacement therapy. Uh, on the uh, last column on the right, you see the recommended evaluation and planning. And as soon as you get to a stage of GFR less than 45, there uh, is concern for the uh, onset of what is called CKD mineral bone metabolism disorders or renal osteodystrophy, whereby uh, there is an approach to make sure that uh, PTH is not elevated and that calcium and vitamin D is adequately addressed in these patients. As you get worse kidney function, then you have the onset of anemia uh, and there is a more aggressive intervention for uh, control of potassium and phosphorus in the diet. And once you get to GFR less than 15, there is consideration of uh, dialysis or tran preemptive transplant at that stage. There, the approach to management of chronic kidney disease has always centered around um, really reduction of adverse outcomes and primarily cardiovascular disease. The main focus has been hypertension and glycemic control, as well as other issues such as the metabolic acidosis, which can adversely affect uh, physical function and bone health. Finally, there's also the entity known as CKD mineral bone disorder or uh, renal osteodystrophy, which is uh, thought to increase the uh, vascular calcification in addition to compromising the integrity of uh, bones, cortical bone in general. So let's start with a, a case of a, of a patient and uh, highlight some of the management uh, issues in this older adult case. Um, so this is a, a case of a 70-year-old male with type 2 diabetes who's found to have microalbuminuria. He has diabetes for the last 15 years. His hemoglobin A1c is 8%. His blood pressure is 146 over 88. The, the rest of his exam really is uh, normal except for some mild background retinopathy. His serum creatinine is 1.8 and his GFR is 37. A year analysis shows a protein of 1 plus equivalent to a albumin to creatinine ratio of 150 milligrams. So the main questions uh, I'd like you to consider when, uh, when approaching a patient like this is how may the, the uh, chronic kidney disease impact his, the treatment of his diabetes and in his particular situation, diabetes in an older adult? What are the recommendations for blood pressure control in older adults, particularly in the setting of the recent SPRINT trial? Um, what are the pitfalls to applying uh, these clinical trial results to the care of older adult patients in a ambulatory setting? And what can you do to uh, mitigate the progression of his chronic kidney disease? And finally, what is the risk of progression to dialysis versus uh, the risk of death by cardiovascular disease in the older adult population in general. So there are three particular challenges I'd like to highlight in his management. Um, first is that uh, there's issues you have to consider when it comes to glycemic control, uh, blood pressure targets in older adults, 
and the issue of what is his risk of progressing to dialysis and how should he be managed. First is glycemic control. So uh, good control of blood glucose is paramount to uh, preventing cardiovascular disease. In the general population, in the UK prospective diabetes study of type 2 patients uh, with di diabetes, a 1% reduction in uh, hemoglobin A1c was associated with a 35% reduction in microvascular endpoints and an 18% reduction of myocardial infarction, as well as 17% reduction in all-cause mortality. However, it's important to keep in mind that um, there are, is the added challenge in older adults of hypoglycemia, and we'll get to the reasons why. Um, the two major studies that looked at um, essentially the benefits and potential complications of glycemic control were the DCCT EDIC trial uh, in type 1 diabetics who were incident diabetics, meaning that they were newly diagnosed diabetics, uh, and the ACCORD trial, which looked at a tight, uh, intense versus standard glycemic control in a more prevalent, high-risk uh, diabetic population. In the left side, you can see in the DCCT EDIC trial, uh, tight glycemic control uh, was associated with a re reduced cumulative incidence of impaired GFR, meaning uh, a reduced risk of progressing to a uh, CKD defined as a GFR less than 60 or uh, initiation of dialysis. And uh, the intense uh, glyce glycemic control uh, diabetic therapy essentially was a hemoglobin A1C less than 8. Uh, a, the conventional arm was less than uh, 9 to 10. Now you contrast that benefit with what is seen in the ACCORD study, where they had prevalent uh, cardiovascular, uh, pre prevalent diabetics, type 2 diabetics mostly, uh, who had uh, cardiovascular disease or were at high risk of car uh, cardiovascular disease. A tight control, where they got their hemoglobin A1C down to 6.4%, was associated with a higher risk of uh, all-cause mortality compared to standard control. So a prevalent diabetic who is high risk, it's important to uh, keep that in mind because you can actually be um, cause more complications, whether related to hypoglycemia or not, uh, and adverse outcomes. So Translating that to what is the current recommendation for targets in chronic kidney disease, it's not as intense as the intense arm of a core. The current guidelines for patients with CKD indicate that you should target a hemoglobin A1C of around 7% uh, to delay uh, pro uh, progression of microvascular complications of diabetes. Part of this is also related to the fact that hemoglobin A1C is not as reliable an indicator of, of mean glucose concentration in patients with CKD. Uh, you can see there are two slopes there. The y-axis here is the hemoglobin A1C and the x-axis is mean glucose. And uh, you can see that the, the correlation coefficient for those that, uh, are, that do not have CKD is, is quite strong at 0.66. However, it's a much more shallower uh, slope and poorer correlation in those with more advanced chronic kidney disease. Uh, one population level study uh, looked at the question of whether or not chronic kidney disease and just reductions in GFR in general, uh, as well as albuminuria, predisposed diabetics to hypoglycemia. They did, uh, it was a very large uh, uh, population cohort study in Ontario, Canada, and they looked at a three-year incidence of hospital encounters with hypoglycemia, whether it was in emergency room encounters or inpatient encounters using the ICD-10 code. And you can see here the, there, where the red bars represent um, the incidence of uh, hypo, the uh, hypoglycemia 
and in different categories of GFR, you can see that it's quite substantial. There is a, a large increase in the in, uh, incidence rate of hypoglycemia admissions uh, in these uh, diabetic patients compared to non-diabetic patients in gray. Uh, and it also uh, appears to be tracking along with the risk categories based on the KDOKI guidelines that we had mentioned, whereas those individuals who were at very high risk had substantially re reductions in their GFR and high levels of albuminuria were at increased, uh, uh, were, had a higher prevalence, I should say, in that subgroup of uh, hospitalization for hypoglycemia. So it, it's, um, there are several potential um, pathophysiologic reasons for this increased propensity for hypoglycemia in chronic kidney disease patients. I'd mentioned before that uh, it, it, the hemoglobin A1C may not uh, correlate as strongly with mean glucose, blood glucose levels. But there's also the thought that uh, some antihyperglycemic medications are metabolized by the kidney and can accumulate in advanced disease. Uh, there's also the fact that a lot of these patients uh, have uh, some polypharmacy and other comorbidities such as cognitive dysfunction and that they may not sense the hypoglycemia until it's too late because a lot of these patients are on beta blockers and that is known to mask hypoglycemic symptoms. Furthermore, there's also the fact that uh, because of the malnutrition inflammation complex that I mentioned earlier, there could be a reduction in uh, glycogen stores as well as a diminished reserve uh, for gluconeogenesis because uh, impaired uh, the kidney is a major source of gluconeogenesis, uh, countering um, the reductions in uh, blood glucose. So you essentially lose that uh, physiologic reserve. The second issue with uh, to or second focus is really blood pressure control, and uh, in this is a um, hotly contested area uh, in chronic kidney disease. Um, but it's important to know that the, in particularly diabetics, uh, our first line of treatment is ACE inhibitors. And ACE inhibitors basically, as you can see from the picture here, uh, relieve the glomerular pressure. And in so doing, uh, by dilating the uh, uh, efferent arterial, can actually preserve the glomerular uh, integrity and uh, maintain filtration. But it is, it's important that it also, ACE inhibitors also have an antiproteinuric effect, so they reduce the amount of protein that escapes into the urinary space and can be toxic to the proximal tubules uh, in the nephron. But what is really important for clinicians and healthcare providers to understand is the effect of hypertension and the additive effect of chronic kidney disease on the ability of the kidney to maintain its perfusion pressure in the setting of antihypertensive use. So the, uh, on this graph below, you can see that the, on the x-axis is the mean arterial blood pressure of a patient, and the y-axis the y is the uh, glomerular pressure, the pressure that's actually in the functional unit of the kidney. And in a normal patient, there is a wide range of blood pressures that the uh, glomerulus can maintain perfusion of the kidney to excrete the toxins. But as you get hypertensive, this curve is shifted to the right such that you need a higher blood pressure to maintain the function of the kidney to clear toxins. If you have chronic kidney disease, the range at which the glomerulus and the kidney itself can maintain its function is reduced. So you can see that the uh, horizontal bar in a patient who has chronic kidney disease is shifted to the right and the range of blood pressures is reduced. So this is why in patients who have chronic kidney disease whose blood pressure is aggressively reduced can end up with acute kidney injury because they do not have the functional reserve to maintain perfusion to their kidney because of their underlying reliance on higher blood pressures. 
So, keeping that in mind, the probably the most important study to come out to date looking at blood pressure control and uh, is the SPRINT trial, a recently concluded trial of intense blood pressure control targeting a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 versus usual control, less than 140. And uh, it was a very large study uh, sponsored by multiple uh, um, na uh, departments in the National Institute of Health, including National Institute of Aging, that looked at 9,361 non-diabetic adults who were at high risk of cardiovascular disease. So they had to have at least one cardiovascular risk factor. Um, and 2,600 of those individuals were 75 years and older. And they excluded uh, severe kidney disease, but included at least moderate chronic kidney disease. And they also excluded uh, severe proteinuria in this group. What they noticed is that um, in the uh, intention to treat analysis, that um, there was a substantial reduction in um, both uh, their primary outcome uh, cardiovascular uh, um, disease and car cardiovascular events and cardiovascular death, uh, as well as death from any cause in the intensive treated arm, which reached an average blood pressure of around 125 systolic. So um, now that's fine and well. Uh, they also looked at subgroup analyses looking at uh, age greater than 75 versus less than 75. And there was no evidence of effect modification by age strata. So the results were just as valid in those who were older as those who were younger. But it's important to be cautious when interpreting these results. First, there is the benefit of the SPRINT trial in that they functionally characterized their uh, older adult population very well. They uh, obtained not only frailty status in this by self-report, but they also assessed the gait speed, a very important objective marker of functional limitation. Now, what you can see here in this article by Supiano in uh, journals uh, in JAGS, there wasn't any uh, st statistically significant uh, association of frailty status with adverse outcome or gait speed status with adverse outcome. So those individuals who were um, frail did not have a statistically significant uh, um, adverse outcome when it came to intensive therapy versus standard therapy, intensive therapy being the white bar and the standard therapy being the black bar. Furthermore, gait speed, if you look stratified by gait speed, and those individuals who had uh, impaired gait speed or slow gait speed of less than 0.8 meters per second, and that is usual gait speed, uh, less than 0.8 meters per second, there was no evidence of a harmful effect either in that group. However, it's important to be cautious when interpreting these results to a um, patient in the clinic setting. It's important to uh, also uh, take into consideration the con epidemiologic concepts of efficacy versus effectiveness. Efficacy is what is assessed under ideal conditions and effectiveness is what is actually uh, the result when you implement it in real, real world practice. In the, the randomized trial in general effect, uh, is, you, is assessing efficacy uh, in under ideal follow-up and surveillance situations, but usual care is very different. And as you can see here, um, in the usual care, the blood pressure management is, um, is a single reading in an office setting, uh, usually in a hurried office setting, whereas in the randomized clinical trial, you have automated blood pressure device that's standardized and you have, a, you, you have a standardized protocol for also taking the blood pressure, which you take it uh, at, uh, with after five minutes of rest, and you check it three times, usually about a minute or two apart. How many people in the office actually have time to do that? The, in addition, orthostatic symptoms are usually assessed by objective measurement in the randomized trial, but only assessed by symptoms in the usual care group. 
Furthermore, blood pressure monitoring is also very different in a clinical trial versus a usual setting. And adherence is strictly enforced uh, or strictly checked in a clinical trial, whereas we don't mo usually monitor adherence strongly in usual care. So all of these uh, lead to an interpretation of the result to be that blood pressure control shouldn't be a, uh, a sprint. It should be more of a marathon when it comes to older adults. So uh, there is a go slow treatment approach for older adults. And many um, societies for blood pressure control haven't really modified their, um, their uh, recommendations for blood pressure control in older adults. Uh, because of sprints, because uh, one size does not fit all, and there's an understanding of efficacy uh, uh, is different from effectiveness. So uh, the go slow treatment approach is usually recommended, and the American Society of Hypertension, uh, the most uh, recent guidelines, which is yet to be updated because a lot of people are fearful of updating them, uh, but recommend you know in the CKD we uh, in older adults. We try to target less than uh, 140 over 90, and in those individuals who are at particularly uh, higher risk because of albuminuria, uh, we target less than 130 over 80. So uh, not quite sprint uh, uh, guidelines. So the other thing, in addition to blood pressure and glucose control uh, in diabetics, there's also uh, the thought that acidosis is a uh, contributor to progression in kidney disease. And this study in the Health ABC looked at 3,000 older adults who were without functional limitation, and they uh, looked at their serum bicarbonate level, and the change in their outcome was a change in GFR using cystatin C um, and creatinine. Now, they used cystatin C to try to offset the confounding effects of creatinine uh, by muscle mass. Muscle, the confounding effects of muscle mass on creatinine measurements. And they looked at, to see uh, what was the change in GFR in those who had worse metabolic acidosis. Their findings showed that, they ha that metabolic acidosis in these older adults led to faster declines in kidney function. Now, uh, hopefully these uh, the, this is uh, easily viewed here, but you get the picture here from looking at it that the relative progression in these older adults is actually pretty small. It's about um, 0.5 ml uh, per minute um, body sur per body surface area per year if you have the worst category relative to the referent category. The worst category is a bicarb less than 23. So uh, it, it's pretty modest, the, uh, the impact on progression, a pretty mild, I should say. But there is one randomized controlled trial in more advanced chronic kidney disease patients where they uh, did a bicarb supplementation in those who had more severe metabolic acidosis and more severe chronic kidney disease with a creatinine clearance of 15 to 30 and a bicarb of 16 to 20. That showed that it actually had uh, a benefit in uh, slowing the progression to end-stage renal disease and improved uh, some nutritional markers in these patients along with uh, a improvement in potassium control. And this is just simple sodium bicarbonate tablets given to these patients with metabolic acidosis. And on the right, you can see that there was an improvement in dialysis-free survival uh, over the two-year follow-up in these uh, pretty severe chronic kidney disease patients. In addition, lifestyle has, is also one thing that can actually slow down progression uh, to, of chronic kidney disease, at least from epidemiologic studies, where in the cardiovascular health study, they looked at a, a cohort of individuals with age six, 76 or older, and they categorized their physical activity based on self-reported leisure time physical activity and walking pace. Um, the outcome was rapid kidney function decline over seven years, uh, indicating a GFR uh, loss of uh, more than 3 ml uh, per year. In this prospective cohort study, you can see here the y-axis is the rate of rapid kidney function decline, and the x-axis is the uh, level of physical activity. So the, the higher the number for the physical activity score, the more active they were at baseline. And you can see that 
at least uh, from this epidemiologic cohort study, those that were most physically active had the lowest rate of uh, rapid kidney function decline. But it's important to take a step back and, uh, and look at what really is the, the risk of progression to dialysis versus the risk of cardiovascular disease in the older adult population. And this study published in JASN by Anne O'Hare was one of the first to look at a large population of veterans, over 200,000, and estimate uh, age adjust, uh, the incidence of uh, end-stage renal disease risk versus death risk at various age groups. And as you can see with the, uh, the x-axis being the age group and the y-axis being the threshold uh, for uh, the initiation of dialysis, that at 85 years or older, practically the greatest risk is really the risk of cardiovascular disease and death before you even get to uh, needing dialysis. So eight, 85 years or over, the risk of, uh, and with advancing age in general, the um, risk of death vastly supersedes the risk of progression. Uh, the last complication that we try to really address uh, in, uh, to, in order to reduce the risk of complications of chronic kidney disease is really uh, the uh, CKD mineral and bone disorder. And as you can see, CKD leads to uh, abnormal levels of uh, parathyroid hormone and phosphorus as well as an inability to convert vitamin D to active vitamin D. And these can uh, coalesce to um, result in bone abnormalities with increasing risk of fracture or vascular disease with uh, metastatic calcifications inside the walls of uh, arterioles. And here you can see on the left is a uh, comp relatively complicated figure, but I want you to know that the main thing that happens with reduction in um, kidney function is really reduced phosphate excretion. So your phosphate goes up. And the phosphate is one of the factors that stimulates PTH production. And it, this uh, increase in PTH can uh, directly affect bone uh, health. In addition, the uh, calcium and phosphorus uh, can actually cause calcification of the media of arteries. And on the right, you can see where the calcification affects the arteries and essentially turns a vascular smooth muscle cell into a bone phenotype uh, cell. So that's not something you want. Usually you see that with uh, much more advanced chronic kidney disease, but now there is a uh, understanding that um, when you get to substantial reduction, you try to limit the uh, uh, amount of phosphorus in the diet and uh, in order to limit the impact on PTH and uh, vascular disease. Here are a couple of x-rays of um, chronic kidney disease patients that have uh, essentially hyperparathyroid bone disease. Uh, what you can see on the left is the spine, and that's uh, a sign considered to be the rugger jersey sign where you have osteosclerosis uh, uh, on the uh, end plates and you have bone resorption in the body of the vertebrae. That can be seen. In addition, you can have resorption of bone in the distal phalanx which you, of the hand, which you can see on the right. So uh, through uh, a resorption of bone. Uh, in this study uh, that was recently published, uh, they looked at the, um, uh, the rate of hospitalization for hip fractures in uh, patients um, who had non-dialysis chronic kidney disease and dialysis uh, requiring chronic kidney disease and compared it to patients without chronic kidney disease. And as you can see that uh, even at at older age 
age groups, um, non-dialysis chronic kidney disease is associated with increased hospitalization uh, for hip fracture. Uh, furthermore, uh, the complications from these hip, tra hip fractures are greater, such that there's a higher ri uh, risk of, uh, or higher uh, likelihood of post-hip fracture mortality and higher research, research, uh, research utilization costs. So in summary, uh, in this section, measurement of uh, kidney function using serum creatinine, you have to recognize that it can be confounded by muscle mass, nutritional status, and certain medication use. Um, lower kidney function is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. And in your, when you're considering treatment in particularly the older adult uh, with chronic kidney disease, you should be cautious in the treatment of uh, diabetes and hypertension uh, in these individuals uh, to uh, avoid uh, adverse events. And among the very old, 85 or older, the risk of death uh, by cardiovascular disease uh, exceeds the risk of progression to dialysis. That's important to keep in mind. And lower kidney function is high, associated with higher hip fracture rates, uh, particularly among older adults. So hopefully I haven't confused everybody there. Um, now for the section that's near and dear to my heart, functional decline in kidney disease. And um, chronic kidney disease is often considered to be a, a model of accelerated aging. And as such, it can be integrated, uh, its pathology can be integrated into the model of the disablement process, particularly the uh, uh, NAGI model of the disablement process that's been uh, uh, empirically tested in the uh, gerontologic, gerontologic literature. In, uh, by this model, chronic kidney disease uh, pathology can lead to uh, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, uh, and inflammation impacting muscle function uh, and structure. Uh, the muscle impairment uh, is, can also be characterized as, as sarcopenia, reduction in muscle mass or function. And this can lead to um, manifestations of functional limitations, which is limitations in uh, the basic tasks that are necessary for uh, independent living. As uh, the uh, burden of the disease gets greater, there is an inability to meet the uh, needs, the activities that are necessary for independent living, such as ambulation. And that can result in mobility disability. Throughout the course, uh, as the burden of the disease gets greater, you can see that reductions in physical activity and ultimately, different aspects of these domains of function, uh, such as uh, muscle impairment, physical uh, or functional limitations, and mobility uh, disability, uh, can manifest as weakness, fatigue, slow gait, and uh, physical inactivity, which are comp important components of the frailty phenotype, which uh, we have shown to be associated with uh, early initiation of dialysis or death. What is the physiologic basis? Well, it's becoming more and more clear that um, reduction in kidney function has uh, effects on uh, the essential functional unit of the muscle, the mitochondria. And uh, the best uh, study to look at this is <laughs> in the murine model, the mouse model, where they took five, six nephrectomized mice and they looked at early phase changes and late phase changes uh, in the muscle of these mice. And what they found is that early changes, they saw substantial increases uh, in oxidative stress after inducing chronic kidney disease, uh, pretty severe chronic kidney disease with that, but uh, chronic kidney disease. They saw a substantial increase in inflammation and uh, oxidative stress with a uh, with a manifestation of reduction in endurance. And then later, only later did they see muscle atrophy and decreased power. And if you look on the right, you can see the early changes are characterized mainly by uh, reductions in the, uh, the amount of mitochondria, the powerhouse of the muscle cell, and its activity per unit of mitochondria. Um, there was no change in muscle size in these animals. 
but there was a profound reduction in mu uh, muscle endurance or uh, running distance. Only later uh, did it, this uh, um, chronic kidney disease uh, manifest as atrophy in the muscle. You can see the gastroc uh, muscle right there and reduction in power. So um, fatigue is quite prominent in chronic kidney disease patients uh, and a quite common complaint in chronic kidney disease patients, even when there is no deficit in actual strength. We sought to actually uh, assess mitochondrial metabolism in our chronic kidney disease patients uh, compared to control and we use non-invasive imaging to actually look at muscle metabolism. And one way to do that is to use the MRS uh, to look at ATP generation uh, as well as uh, uh, optical spectroscopy to look at muscle oxygen use. The ratio of ATP generation to oxygen consumption is, is classically defined as the coupling ratio, which is a measure of the efficiency of uh, mitochondrial metabolism, taking substrates, uh, using oxygen to metabolize those substrates into ATP that's necessary to power muscle contraction. As you can see here on, on the top, the, uh, compared to age and gender match controls, our CKD patients have substantial reductions in the uh, ability to use the oxygen to generate ATP with thus a lower P to O ratio compared to controls. And even within the CKD population, it looked like those that had worse kidney function had uh, worse efficiency in mitochondrial metabolism. We also looked at, in the older adult population, uh, in the Inchianti study, which is a prospective study of the complications of aging in a uh, northern Italian Tuscan cohort, uh, probably the uh, model for healthy aging. But uh, we looked at, in these, this population, with an average age of uh, 74 and 56% females, uh, we looked at the association of creatinine clearance, which takes into account not only the filtration, but also the clearance function of the kidney, and its association with calf muscle density and knee extension strength over time. And what you can see in this table here is that um, the lower the kidney function, per 10 ml per minute lower kidney function, the, uh, the uh, estimate of association of kidney function on reductions in muscle density was equivalent to one year of advancing age. So this is uh, one of the demonstrations of kidney disease advancing kidney disease as a marker of accelerated aging when it comes to um, sarcopenia. Furthermore, if you look at the right graph on the bottom, you see on the x-axis is the exam age, the follow-up exam age in years, and on the y-axis is the knee extension strength, and each line represents a level of kidney function. One thing you can see is that uh, compared to the creatinine clearance, which is 90 or greater, that group, the creatinine clearance less than 60 was associated with a steeper slope of decline over time in knee extension strength. So these, patient, these uh, individuals in, uh, with more severe kidney disease were losing knee extension strength over the course of follow-up. And you can see it's adjusted for body size, uh, education, and age. Furthermore, um, chronic kidney disease uh, can, uh, uh, can manifest as functional limitation. And one particular measure of functional limitation is usual gait speed, which is a potent measure of uh, potently associated with uh, all-cause mortality and uh, mobility disability. So in our Seattle kidney study, we looked at the association of GFR cystatin C um, with uh, changes in gait speed over time. And you can see that uh, even in this younger cohort uh, of outpatient referred uh, patients with kidney disease with mean age of 53 and a median follow-up of three years who were not disabled at baseline, you can see that lower GFR cystatin C uh, was associated with more rapid declines 
in uh, Gatesby. So there are several ways to assess uh, functional limitations. Um, and uh, one of them is objective physical performance assessment. And uh, in the gerontologic literature, uh, objective physical performance chain, uh, assessment, uh, particularly lower extremity objective physical performance, captures the physiologic changes associated with chronic illness, aging, and sedentary lifestyle. There's, um, they're also, it's also associated with risk of disability even among the non-disabled individuals. And uh, in, um, in some practices, is considered a clinical vital sign. Uh, of the burden of disease on, uh, on patients. Uh, poor physical performance and lower extremity tasks in particular have been associated in multiple populations with future risk of mobility, disability, hospitalization, death, or death in older adults. We looked at um, various uh, physical performance tests uh, in our chronic kidney disease population, first to characterize the level of decrement in these physical performance tasks and to comparatively assess the association of uh, physical performance with death. You can see uh, we cat categorized individuals into fast time to up and go. Time to up and go, up and go is basically getting up from a chair, walking four meters around the cone and coming back to seated position, uh, the, the fastest of uh, two attempts. And we categorized them into slow, uh, which is greater than 12 seconds, and uh, uh, fast, which is less than 12. That's commonly seen in the literature. And we saw that uh, those who were um, slower were on average older, had a higher BMI um, and a lower kidney function uh, than those who were faster. It was, uh, but across the board, uh, the lower extremity physical performance tasks were on average 35% uh, worse uh, than what would be predicted in this uh, population based on age and gender. It's important to see that the strength decrement in our uh, kidney disease population, the grip strength decrement, was no different from uh, what would be predicted for age and sex. However, the, uh, the lower extremity physical performance tests were much worse. And the uh, looking at a comparative association of these uh, physical performance measures there seemed to be a uh, relatively strong association of poor physical performance and the lower extremity with mortality. And you can see that here, where our usual gait speed, the slower your usual gait speed, the, uh, uh, the more time it took you to do a timed up and go, and the shorter the distance you walked in, in six minutes was associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality. Grip strength was also associated with death, but didn't survive adjustment for demographics and, uh, and comorbidity. So um, muscle impairment, as we talked about, uh, is one of the um, uh, mediators of uh, functional decline in uh, particularly kidney disease patients. And we looked at uh, how muscle endurance versus muscle strength is associated with um, uh, both a combined outcome of functional limitation and mobility disability. In a, about 2,000 patients who were community dwelling older adults in the health ABC population who had um, uh, estimation of their kidney function. And the mean age of this population was 75, and we looked at isokinetic uh, uh, testing of their uh, quadriceps strength, over 30 repetitions to calculate total work, and we looked at isometric maximal strength. And the outcome in this population was uh, called persistent severe lower extremity limitation, which is incident severe difficulty or an inability to either walk one quarter mile on a flat surface or ascend 10 steps. And it, it had to be on two uh, occasions six months apart because these patients were called every six months and had an annual follow-up. And you can see here that on uh, the left, uh, the graph on the left, it, you see on the y-axis is the risk of persistent severe lower extremity limitation. And on the x-axis is 
the work, quadriceps work that's performed, uh, divided by the size of the quadriceps muscle. And you can see that the greater the um, quadriceps work, uh, which means greater muscle endurance, there is a reduction in the risk of this combined endpoint of functional limitation and mobility disability, self-reported. The association was also seen with uh, um, the uh, maximal strength as well. However, the association was less uh, obvious after adjustment uh, for um, uh, comorbidity. Um, it's important to note that this association also persisted in those patients who had chronic kidney disease in sub-analysis. There was no uh, evidence of effect modification by kidney disease status. <clears throat> so now we get to the frailty phenotype, which I mentioned to you that um, each of the domains of uh, the disablement process, each of the aspects of the disablement process can contribute to the overall frailty phenotype. But what is the frailty phenotype? Frailty is a terminal clinical syndrome of vulnerability that's characterized by slowness of gait, uh, weakness, uh, low physical activity, low energy, and weight loss. Um, across uh, populations of older adults is associated with disability and hospitalization along with death in older adults. We looked at the prevalence of, um, of fra the frailty phenotype in uh, kidney disease patients versus uh, the community dwelling older adults and uh, in comparing the Seattle kidney study which is uh, had a mean age of 59 years and a uh, BMI of around 31. Uh, compared that to the gold standard um, uh, cohort of older adults that was used to define the frailty phenotype, the cardiovascular health study, uh, with a mean age that was nearly uh, 20 years older and a uh, smaller BMI, but uh, equivalent level of disability. And you can see that the frailty prevalence was double uh, in the kidney disease, younger kidney disease population, compared to the older, uh, older adult population uh, by almost 20 years. Furthermore, the um, frailty phenotype in the younger chronic kidney disease patients captured mobility disability, such that the uh, um, frail patients had uh, um, greater than double the prevalence of mobility disability. Furthermore, if you looked at um, the risk of dialysis initiation, the um, frail individuals were more than 2.5-fold greater risk of initiating dialysis early or dying or initiating dialysis early compared to um, non-frail patients. And that was greater than the impact of just diabetes and cardiovascular disease alone. Uh, important uh, components uh, associate, uh, associated with um, initiation of dialysis or death uh, before dialysis were low physical activity and slow walk. Furthermore, there's uh, another uh, community dwelling older adult population uh, or community dwelling uh, adult population in the atherosclerotic risk in community study. Uh, in this study, there were about 5,000 patients with a mean age of 75.6 years. The, the authors of this study took the um, KDGO uh, risk stratification system and they looked at the prevalence ratios of um, frailty in each of these risk categories. A very interesting way of doing the analysis. But you can see that the higher risk categories had substantially greater prevalence of frailty compared to the uh, to those in the lower category with the um, minimal risk category being the reference group such so there was a 7.2 greater risk of uh, frailty or 7.2 great, fold greater prevalence of frailty in the most severe increased uh, severe risk group compared to the reference group here furthermore in the cardiovascular health study, they looked at what about um, baseline kidney uh, function? What is the risk of um, diagnosis of, of frailty in the cardiovascular health study at four years of follow-up based on the level of GFR? If 
by cystatin C. And you can see that the greatest risk category, um, first of all, there was a continuous association of lower GFR with risk of frailty, and that the greatest risk category was uh, uh, 15 to 44 ml per minute. That was associated with a greater than twofold risk of uh, incident frailty uh, at four years. So the big question is, so patients with uh, chronic kidney disease have a higher prevalence of frailty. They're at increased risk of frailty. So what about dialysis? Does dialysis maybe reduce the burden of disability in those patients who are frail? Um, and this study in, uh, in published by Corella Tamura and Kovinsky uh, in New England Journal of Medicine was, uh, was really groundbreaking in looking at dialysis in a different light, particularly about, among frail elders. They took a National Registry of Nursing Home Residents, which was started, uh, which had a population of around 3,700 individuals, and they uh, looked at the uh, functional status using uh, minimum data set activities of daily, daily living, which were scored on 0 to 28, with higher scores being uh, greater functional uh, difficulty. And their outcome was really the change in functional status in this uh, MDS um, at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months after the initiation of dialysis. Average age in this study was 73. And here are the results, which are uh, really shocking. Um, the initiation of dialysis was associated with a decline in functional status independent of age, sex, race, trajectory, uh, and trajectory of uh, functional decline even before the start of dialysis. You can see on the left um, that uh, months on the y-axis is the months since uh, initiation of dialysis and the x-axis is the percent of residents with each of the um, functional status uh, 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 assessments and uh, whether or not they die. So as you can see as you uh, m with more months uh, on dialysis, you see a substantial greater risk uh, or a greater prevalence of death in this cohort, but you also see that there is a substantial reduction in the uh, medium blue uh, region, which indicates that there's a substantial reduction in the proportion of individuals whose functional status was maintained. And at the right is the shocking figure of uh, what happens to the uh, MDS score or the functional status and cumulative mortality. And you see the dashed line in the center is zero, indicating the initiation of dialysis. Prior to the initiation of dialysis, there uh, appears to be a decline in the uh, um, functional status score. But right after the initiation, it's really bad. Um, and the, in, uh, the cumulative mortality is substantial after the initiation of dialysis. You know, it, there is a potential therapy for uh, probably less uh, frail individuals who are on dialysis, and uh, this recent trial in uh, older adults, uh, in not older adults, but in dialysis patients, points to a potential uh, lifestyle intervention that may improve at least physical performance and function. Uh, it's called the Exercise Introduction to Enhanced uh, Performance in Dialysis Patient Trial, uh, the EXCITE trial. And uh, we were all excited about this trial when it was published. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, no pun intended, but uh, six, six months personalized home-based walking exercise program to improve walking capacity and muscle strength compared to unusual care. Really, this, uh, this was the kidney disease community's response to the LIFE trial, um, which was uh, va vastly larger. But nonetheless, it's our first effort to see in, in a randomized clinical trial uh, setting, can a home-based walking exercise pr program at least preserve physical performance? In these individuals, we, they were excluded uh, participants who had severely limited mobility and high degree of fitness, uh, as well as uh, pretty advanced heart failure in this population. The um, basic intervention was a, um, get a metronome uh, that uh, basically increased the cadence of walking speed. 
Um, and the patients were asked on non-dialysis days to perform this walking-based intervention with increasing cadence. They started, their initial cadence was based on the level of their six minute walk distance, so they tried to uh, assess function at that point. And then uh, looked at it beyond that. And this is the uh, results that they saw. They saw that uh, there was a substantial improvement in the six minute walk test in those who exercised versus the control group. And there was a substantial uh, uh, increased um, speed at which they were able to perform the five seconds, uh, five times to stand. Furthermore, there was a, uh, also evidence that there was a um, dose-dependent effect with those individuals who had uh, more adherence to the exercise intervention, which was judged based on the pedometer battery. Um, they had even greater gains when it came to these uh, physical performance measures. But of course, there's a challenge to exercise, which uh, is the high degree of frailty in the kidney disease population and the waning over time of adherence. Uh, so it's important to take into consideration the functional status of these patients uh, before prescribing an individualized exercise prescription. And some uh, uh, experts have recommended that it, the preclinical mobility disability be assessed as well as physical performance be assessed to triage these patients into a rehabilitative therapy, such as physical therapy, prior to the initiation of uh, any exercise regimen. And there's very simple ways of doing this. Uh, on this slide here, which you have in your handout, is to just assess for uh, if they have any, increase, any difficulty in ascending steps or walking a quarter mile, or if they've modified their steps. Or you can take a very simple assessment of gait speed or SPPD to look at this. So in summary, uh, CKD is associated with skeletal muscle impairment. Um, the impaired physical performance is very common in, in patients with CKD and is strongly associated with mortality and mobility disability. Uh, older adults uh, with chronic kidney, uh, with lower kidney function at increased risk of frailty associated with early uh, initiation of death, uh, uh, death or initiation of dialysis. And among older nursing home uh, residents, Dialysis initiation is associated with decline in functional status, um, and early evidence suggests ambulatory exercise may potentially improve physical performance and muscle strength in dialysis patients. So uh, I'm running out of time here, so I wanted to make time for questions, so I'll uh, just uh, go through this one study that um, looked at uh, dialysis versus conservative management uh, in the uh, older adult population. It's a retrospective survival analysis of a single center cohort study in the Netherlands. And it was the, one of the first to look at uh, the comparative survival analysis of the patients who underwent conservative management versus those who underwent uh, renal replacement therapy. And the uh, main point of this study was that among those in the, the Dutch population, which is a relatively healthy population compared to our um, uh, US population, the older than 80 years of age, there was no uh, statistically significant advantage uh, to, uh, in terms of survival in that group. Uh, among those that were 70 to, 80, uh, to 79 years, there was, however, some evidence of a, a survival advantage of dialysis initiation, but older uh, adults did not. So, um, and so the take-home points I won't, uh, I'd like to highlight from this uh, talk is that first, lower kidney function is measured by estimated glomerular filtration or albuminuria is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. Second, that lower kidney function among the old, uh, older adults in particular complicates the treatment of diabetes and hypertension. A go-slow approach and a more conservative approach is likely uh, needed in these patients. Among the oldest old, uh, greater than 85 years, the risk of death um, pretty much uh, exceeds uh, the, the risk of progression to uh, dialysis in this demographic. And that lower kidney function is associated with sarcopenia, functional limitation, and increasing risk of frailty. 
uh, dialysis initiation among nursing home uh, dwelling older adults is uh, related to is associated with pretty substantial functional decline and increased risk of mortality, um, uh, which should be considered when counseling these patients. And uh, what I didn't get uh, to, but what you can see on your slides, is that an integrative palliative care and a rehabilitative therapies approach are important considerations among patients with advanced kidney disease, particularly older adults with advanced kidney disease. So I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Kushan Patel who's, uh, um, uh, for his uh, mentorship and uh, his expertise in functional uh, decline and aging um, for his uh, um, uh, support. And if you have any questions, here is my uh, email. I'm glad to answer them if uh, I don't answer them during the remaining 15 minutes. Thank you very much. So we did have a question asking about peritoneal dialysis in older adults. Yes. So peritoneal dialysis um, is a, a much more benign form of dialysis that we do perform. The only problem is that um, it is, uh, it's a bit complicated in functionally impaired older adults uh, because a lot of the nursing homes or assisted living facilities don't help them with that. But uh, let me step back and talk about the basics of peritoneal dialysis. I guess is, is the question, what is peritoneal dialysis? No, it's more just in older adults because you've talked a lot about dialysis. Yeah. And they're assuming you meant hemodialysis. Yes, so. exactly. The hemodialysis is, is what I focused on and what all the studies focus on. Now, um, the, the, there are thoughts that peritoneal dialysis obviously preserves function in older adults, mainly because of the fact that they can remain active while they dialyze. So um, in older adults, in, I think in any person, ideally we would put them on peritoneal dialysis. It's a much safer dialysis because you don't get the rapid fluid shifts. And in older adults, it would be more ideal um, because of the fact that their body habitus doesn't require a lot of clearance. So it is generally considered a safer um, form of dialysis with a continuous dialysis. However, it does require a higher level of uh, executive functioning, which is often a limitation in patients who have pretty advanced chronic kidney disease. So uh, if we often try to push home therapies whenever possible, uh, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. But uh, peritoneal dialysis at the University of Washington, we're big fans of peritoneal dialysis when it's possible based on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and so Cheyenne, I'm not sure if they were also referring to um, peritoneal dialysis, but they asked what is um, potentially conservative treatment versus dialysis for kidney disease? So conservative treatment uh, is now considered to be a integrated palliative uh, and nephrologic uh, approach where we control the blood pressure so that it, it doesn't lead to symptoms. We control pain, we control the symptoms of uremia. For instance, one of the reasons people present to the, the hospital is a volume overload. So we do everything we can uh, with uh, multidisciplinary intervention, whether it's dietary intervention, uh, we also uh, can give them binders on an outpatient basis to sort of prevent hyperkalemia from being an issue and address symptoms by escalating the diuretics if they need to. But um, it's, it's really an integrative approach whereby there is a... Um, a direct communication between the nephrologist, palliative care experts, and the patient and their caregivers of, of a, a conservative approach to management, such that we don't immediately reflexively jump to dialysis, but we consider the patient's perspective. We treat pain uh, whenever possible, 
in the, this overall. It's just a symptoms management approach. And uh, here's a question. How do you treat a magnesium waster when other labs are normal? Controlling hypertension is an issue, I guess, for the case. Is there something else? A magnesium waster when other labs are, are normal? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, the, the one of the ways you have to figure it out is are they losing it from their gut or are they losing it from their kidney? That's a big question. Um, you know, um, uh, Sometimes giving slow magnesium rather than um, giving mag oxide may um, help in that type of setting. Uh, but the big question is, are they really wasting it in their kidney? Um, there are studies that show that PPIs can increase the risk of magnesium, hypomagnesemia, uh, but those studies are compounded by the fact that patients are also on diuretics, which also waste magnesium. So the question is, um, you know, we, uh, nephrologists can assess a fractional excretion of magnesium to see if it's actually something that's being lost in the kidney or is it actually being lost in the stool. That's the first step we would take. Uh, if there is uh, evidence of uh, wasting in the, the urine, uh, one of the culprits is, is diuretics as a possibility. So, but that's assuming that there is no inherited disorder, um, like. Uh, there are some inherited disorders that cause mag wasting, but think of PPIs, diuretics, and stool loss uh, or kidney loss. Mm -hmm. So those are the differentials that we think of. Um, and the question says, I'm thinking in terms of a stroke patient I happen to know who really doesn't want to do much for himself. So far as I know, his kidneys are working just fine right now, even though he is borderline diabetic. Any thoughts? Uh, and you might repeat yeah. a little bit of that. Yeah. So, so the, the question is, there's a patient who has uh, had a stroke, he's a borderline diabetic, uh, and he doesn't want to control his blood pressure very well? Or is there... um, I don't, maybe that's what he needs, but I don't know. So, uh, yeah, so the, I, I assume the question is that it, there's a patient who has had a stroke, uh, he has... Doesn't want to do much for himself. Uh, doesn't want to do much for himself. Um, these are, this is always the, uh, a, a big question, um, and it, it's whether or not, what are the reasons why he doesn't want to do things for himself? Um, patients don't usually act in isolation. There's social circumstances around which, uh, they, that have to be considered when, uh, looking at a treatment approach for the patient. Um, what is the patient's living situation? Uh, does he have uh, uh, access to um, what is the financial situation, the resources around there? Furthermore, patients who with stroke can have still my, mild cognitive impairment. Um, so it's a very difficult question to answer without knowing the social situation uh, of the patient um, and whether or not he has a, a caregiver that is providing him with input. Probably one of the best things that we notice is that if a patient has a caregiver, it's very important to get them involved in the, uh, um, the clinic setting, is to have them there. Patients with chronic kidney disease don't necessarily relay, uh, retain all that is said in a complicated clinical setting, and it's really important for the caregiver to be there. So I, I, I would strongly encourage um, delving into the social circumstances of the patient. Okay, and then, in so the, another person who concerns me is a guy who has had hep C for at least 17 years. What can he expect? Mm -hmm. um, the big question is again, um, 17 years, is he, um, how old is he? Um, and uh, it, is he, I mean, if we were to see the average hep C patient at Harborview is an IV drug uh, user. And so we often get patients who have amyloidosis in kidney and rapidly progress. But that's not necessarily the case for all patients who have hep C. They can have chronic hep C uh, that is low level with no evidence of kidney function or dysfunction. Um, we often uh, see signs of red blood cells in the urine and proteinuria if the hep C actually impacts the kidney 
And in those types of situations, uh, we can perform a biopsy to actually see if it's a hep C related kidney injury. And we refer them to hepatology for treatment of their hep C. And then I've had clients that their diabetes is gone after dialysis starts. How does that happen? So that's a good question. Um, one of the ways that uh, diabetes may actually improve uh, is that, um, remember, insulin is also cleared by the kidneys. So um, when you lose kidney function, the insulin can actually uh, accumulate and you actually get a paradoxic increased sensitivity to uh, uh, insulin because of the lack of clearance. So we often have patients who actually have problems with hypoglycemia um, who are on, uh, who have uh, problems um, with hypoglycemia and insulin.